And I think it's easy with how difficult the job of a barista is to lose that magic that initially draws you in. I have found coffee competitions to be an incredibly inspiring place to regain a lot of that magic. Sometimes I feel like this is maybe the misconception within the coffee industry that, yes, we have amazing coffee, we have expensive coffees, and we're done. No, we're not done. We can ultimately make it better if we are able to read what the person, what the guest of the coffee shop is after. So the coffee competition isn't just about the competitor. The judges learn a lot as well. They learn to evaluate coffee and techniques, and that goes back into their businesses and into their cafes. What's the value um, and who gets the value? I think those questions we need to sort of always be asking, and the competitions need to change, and there are some pretty significant changes planned for the competitions. Welcome back to the Fifth Wave podcast. I'm Jeffrey Young, editor-in-chief of coffee business magazine, Fifth Wave. Competitions are deeply embedded into the culture of specialty coffee. Almost every trade show and coffee festival will have a competition stage brimming with competitors, spectators, and MCs. And there's certainly a lot of fun. But there's a lot more to competitions than perfectly choreographed routines and shiny trophies. Competitions play a serious and important role in developing the coffee community by elevating standards and profoundly impacting the careers of competitors. But many of these benefits go unnoticed, eclipsed by the dazzle of the competition spectacle. And so, in this episode, we're pulling back the curtain by speaking with former and current competitors to show the various ways coffee competitions develop the industry and asking what it takes to win. We're speaking with Gwilym Davies, Morgan Ekroth, and Rastislav Kassar. And let's begin with Stephen Morrissey, who is the Specialty Coffee Association's Deputy Chief Commercial and Community Experience Manager. Stephen began his career in coffee in Ireland in the 1990s and has worked with Intelligentsia and Square Mile. He helps coordinate the SEA's approach to competitions and in this interview offers us insight into how competitions support the SEA's mission and how they will be evolving. And by the way, Steve himself is also a World Brister champion, winning the competition in 2008. Welcome. Thanks very much, Jeffrey. Nice to be here. So yourself having won the World Brister Championships, what, what is the, the real benefit that competitions bring to our industry? I suppose there's a few. I think anything that brings the industry together is valuable. Anything that gives a reason for people to gather has value. I think storytelling is incredibly valuable and competition provides a stage for storytelling and showcasing of skills and how what tends to happen quite often is when there's a particularly striking routine or competitor that their story and the story of everyone else involved sort of catches on and becomes something people talk about. And then probably the most obvious one then is how we can celebrate new ideas and excellence. And there's a long list of new approaches, new techniques, new technology that has been born out of that from those stages. And there's a group called the Competition Strategic Committee, which is a bunch of judges, competitors, organizers, volunteers who help guide the direction of the competitions and, you know, seven world championships. And that group recently reformed after the pandemic and There was a meeting in 2017 in Frankfurt where the group had created a five-year vision for all the competitions and how we would like to see them change. And it was a lot about getting to your question. What is the core value? What is the main thing they can offer? And there's been a lot of conversation about that. I think a lot of healthy conversation because sometimes people will view the competitions as becoming a bit dull, a bit flat, a bit repetitive, or they might say it's inaccessible. And I think those tend to be valid, but also contained to someone's unique perspective. Because cup tasters, for example, you just need a spoon and a palate. So I think the question of why do it and who is it for 
and what's the value um, and who gets the value. You know, is it limited to just to the companies who support the baristas? Is it limited to the SCA? Is it limited to the farmers? I think those questions we need to sort of always be asking and the competitions need to change. And there are some pretty significant changes planned for the competitions. Um, a piece of advice that you might give to a young barista who's thinking about entering their first competition. I've probably said the same one all the time. And it's the same advice I'd give to anyone looking to open a business is, you know, authenticity and kind of, you know, do you, <laughs> you know, it's if you try to be a version of what you think will win or be successful, I think that often falls flat and as often people realize when it's not sincere or it's not authentic. You know, we see that in coffee shops that they start getting homogenous in their design. You see that in routines that feel, you know, manufactured and just kind of remixes of a bunch of other routines. Um, one of the things that comes up all the time in, in the competitions is a language barrier, is the fact that English is the dedicated language and that sets a advantage to anyone who's naturally English speaking. But there are many people who've won who are not native English speakers. And it's because they're authentic. It's because they have a level of charm and character. And I, and I, I think one of the really fascinating areas is how your experience informs what you taste and how well you enjoy something. And your experience of the, the way the table feels, the way glasses feel, the way the person is in making eye contact with you, the way everything about the environment and how much that informs what's in the cup. I mean, you know, that's been a topic that's kind of come up at so many events around the world in coffee, how design and the, ex the extrinsic values informing the intrinsic. It sort of lives beyond the rules. It's not as mathematical. And I think that's where, that's where the sort of human side of it all becomes really fun, which is sort of, for most people, what their, what their draw to coffee is. is sh sure, it's tasty, but so is wine, so is beer, <laughs> so is pizza. It's the people and the spaces and the, um, the global nature of it that is such a draw. Finally, what can we expect at this year's WBC that's coming up in, in the next couple of weeks? I don't know, Jeff, because I feel like it does keep changing. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have the, the fortune to be able to sit down and watch all the routines. Yeah. But I, look, the, let, let me say this. There is a desire to change the competitions, but any change we ever make ruffles a lot of feathers. Every time we change anything in the competition, because of the size of the competition, the amount of people who compete every year, the amount of countries that hold their national and regional competitions, the whole architecture of the thing is so massive that the smallest of changes, whether it's a new sponsored equipment, you know, the one, the one I always joke about is when we changed color of crema and said that's no longer important. It's huge. It took about a year or two to get that across the finish line. <laughs> so people who are pushing now for bigger changes and want to see maybe compulsory rounds or plant-based worked in, all that stuff has been part of the agenda for a long time. But we have a responsibility with the competition because I think this is something I, I like to think about is that for a long time, the competition was the standard setter when it came to coffee shop brewing, sorry, barista techniques. What was a good espresso? 25 seconds. And sort of, if you follow the technical score sheet and were just being thoughtful about how you cleaned out your portafilter basket and flushed between shots, the feeling was that there was so far for the industry to go around the world that the presence of the competition was, had such massive educational value. Now, I think times have changed. It is not so difficult to find out what the standards are. And while competitions still definitely serve that purpose, it does take off some of that burden for the competitions to be so prescriptive in what special looks like, what delicious looks like, what excellence looks like. And so then we get into a really interesting place as if, if the format of the competition can evolve to allow for more interpretations of what special is. And this, this actually goes to a key thing SCA is working on, a, a big project we have over the next couple of years is the whole idea of, of assessing coffee's value. And we are making some significant changes. We're currently trialing a new cupping form, which is sort of the industry standard, and we're looking at changing that. But it, it's stemming from this idea that, you know, some people bemoan the fact that there isn't a crystal clear definition of what specialty coffee is. And we have been reluctant to quantify that because, first off, who are we to say what that is? That your experience is special, but your, sorry, your friend's isn't. And... You know, our flavor wheel 
that has been this enormous success and you see it in so many places. But there are many people in the world who, who look at that and go, the things you're saying aren't good, I like. And the flavors you're all referencing aren't in my part of the world. So how do I even know what you're talking about? And I think that's led to this view we have, and it goes back again to the extrinsic versus intr- intrinsic and the idea that how a coffee is prepared and how a coffee is transacted and sourced is all part of what defines specialty. And we've got to find a different way of talking about what quality is that is a little bit more accommodating to different viewpoints. That doesn't mean diluting it, doesn't mean throwing quality at the door. It's just acknowledging that one person's quality is different to another's. And so that is going to manifest in some really big ways over the next couple of years for SCA. It's a huge project for us. But competitions becomes then for us a really valuable way of maybe pushing that agenda out there as well and looking at how the format of the competition changes to allow for different interpretations of what special can be. Stephen, amazing. Thanks so much for being here today with us on Fifth Wave. Pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It's clear from speaking with Stephen that the SEA's competitions are a critical tool in bringing their global agenda to life and they remain a powerful way of diffusing knowledge and increasing technical skills throughout the entire coffee community. But what does that diffusion actually look like? We now speak with 2009 World Barista Champion Willem Davies, founder of London's iconic Proof Rock Cafe, a coffee judge. He also runs his own barista training center and recently launched his own coffee brand, The Naughty Dog. Now, this interview segment you're going to hear is only a few minutes long, but our full interview lasted over an hour and is a powerful story of personal growth of one of the industry's most loved coffee professionals. We'll share the entire interview with Gwilym as a bonus next week. But right now, let's hear a few minutes on his reflections on the positive impact competitions have on the coffee industry. So welcome to Fifth Wave. Hello, Jeffrey. So what do you think the, the significance is of coffee competitions ultimately to the coffee industry? So the coffee competition isn't just about the competitor. The judges learn a lot as well. They learn to evaluate coffee and techniques, and that goes back into their businesses and into their cafes. People who get the chance to organise events who've probably never organised them before, that experience goes back into their cafes and their companies. It depends what country you're in. If you run competitions on a national scale in countries, but you're only using people from your country, you're not inviting speakers, you're not inviting outside judges or organisers, then you end up with this very insular community that seems to have its own ideas about what standards are. I really enjoy things like the Coffee Masters. Because of the international element with it and that it's pretty open to who can come, it's mostly skills-based. It's not money-based. You don't need to bring really expensive coffees or have special gear. You just turn up with your barista skills. So what advice would you give to a new barista that wants to get into coffee and perhaps even compete? From my judge's perspective, the two things that I found judging that shocked me is baristas don't read the rules of the competition. Very important. Whatever competition it is, read the rules. And the second, if there's things for you to practice, practice them. If it's built around a routine like the World Barista Championship, actually go through the routine, go through the setup, go through the routine and do it again and again. As a competitor's perspective, the thing is, it's very likely that you're not going to win. So know why you're competing. Find out why you're competing. It's not just because you want to win. There's other reasons. So find out what they are and build that in. Well, Willem... Thanks so much for joining us here today on Fifth Wave. Yes, it's nice to chat to you. William argues that the value of the competitions is not just about winning, 
Judges and competitors take learnings and apply these to their businesses, allowing for a filtering down, no pun intended, of better coffee practices all around the world. Now let's speak with current US barista champion, Morgan Eckroth, to learn what it takes to develop a winning routine and why a barista would want to compete at all. Morgan is a social media sensation with over 5 million followers on TikTok and closing in on a million in Instagram and works with US Roaster Onyx Coffee Lab as content marketing specialist. Welcome, Morgan. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's an honor. Before we get started, I wonder if you could tell us how you got into coffee. Yeah, absolutely. So I started working in coffee when I was 18, um, but I was actually first introduced to coffee when I was 16. So I was a a little bit of a late bloomer. I didn't grow up in a family that drinks coffee and they actually still don't drink coffee to this day. But I got my driver's license when I was 16. And the very first thing I did, I remember this very distinctly, was drive to a coffee shop for the very first time. I very quickly found that cafes and coffee shops were a space that I really enjoyed being in. I really enjoyed the people that I found there. And coffee itself was just something that was super fascinating to me. Throughout my high school time while I was living in Corvallis, Oregon, I had this one coffee shop I'd go to like almost every single day. And I just kept applying there. I I knew I wanted to be a barista. And unfortunately, at that time, I was kind of like, no availability, no experience, nothing. But I was I was very passionate about it. So I persisted at that shop until finally when I was 18 and I just started college, they finally asked if I wanted an interview. So I worked as a barista all the way through college. And then coming out of college, I ultimately found myself staying in coffee, which was a huge blessing. It's something I still am super passionate about. When did you start entering barista competitions? What was the appeal? What was the catalyst to say, actually, I want to take part? (laughs) I've always been pretty competitive. And so competitions have always had a lot of allure to them. I didn't know much about barista competitions uh, when I first started working in coffee, though. And actually, the first intro to competition wasn't even like the U.S. coffee championships. It was actually the Barista League. One of my coworkers and I competed in their Portland event. We both really, really loved it. And coming out of it, my boss at the time, who had competed in barista championships in the past, was like, you seem to really love that. Have you looked into the barista championships at all? And at that point, I was like, I don't know what that is, but I would love to do it. So I dived into YouTube. I watched a ton of routines and had this moment where I was like, this is something I want to do. And so the very first year I competed was 2019. I did qualifiers and nationals that year. And it was very scrappy. I was just like making it up as I went along. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was like enjoying myself through it. And I got the bug after that. And I was just ready to keep doing it after that year. So what does it take to become a U.S. barista champion? A lot of time and effort. It is a long and often grueling process preparing for the barista championships. I think on average, over the past couple years of competing, I usually spend, oh gosh, anywhere from two to four months in advance, like really preparing for it. The format of the barista competitions being a 15-minute presentation with some sort of like very well-written out script and theme, along with all the technical aspects, just takes so long to pull together. So usually kind of in the four to three months before the competition time period, that's when I really start diving into deciding what I want to talk about that year. So I'll start building out a rough outline of a script at the very least. And then getting closer to that two-month mark, that's where I'm starting to be like, all right, what are the drinks I'm preparing? What is the coffee I'm using? What are all these other pieces? And then for definitely that last month, if not a little bit longer, it is just multiple rehearsals of your presentation every single day. And it it very quickly turns into almost a full-time job in and of itself. What do you feel is the significance or value that coffee competitions bring? I can speak a little bit to my own personal experience with coffee competitions, there have been many times in my career as a like an on the floor barista, which is something I still do to this day, where you face burnout a lot. And I think it's very easy to fall into the routine of just clocking in and clocking out and not finding as much joy in coffee or in the job of a barista as maybe you once did coming in. I think it's easy with how 
difficult the job of a barista is to lose that magic that initially draws you in. I have found coffee competitions to be an incredibly inspiring place to regain a lot of that magic. I know personally a lot of my own growth, both as a person and then also just as a coffee professional, has come out of competition just because it forces you so deeply into this world of coffee of just one singular coffee you're competing with, of researching, of preparing, and of really gaining a new appreciation for this drink that we serve every single day. And even beyond that, I think barista competitions are a fantastic like community building thing as well. You're not necessarily competing against other people. Your, your routine very much exists on its own in kind of its own silo. So as a competitor, you don't really think of yourself as being against anyone else. And that tends to, for the most part, foster a really, really cool environment where you have all these competitors backstage who are incredibly passionate. They have just been working as hard as possible for the last two to six months. And it's this cool community space of everyone supporting one another. And I think that's a really special thing about barista competitions. It seems like there's a lot of teamwork involved in getting someone through the nationals and ultimately to the world championships. Can you tell me about the team that you're working with? It's definitely a team effort. I think there are amazing competitors who have been able to do it all themselves, which is absolutely incredible. But it kind of does take a village to put someone on stage. And so all the previous years that I've competed, I've always had some sort of coach, some sort of like team behind me. But this year was definitely more so than any other years. So I worked with Onyx Coffee Lab this year and I actually work for them now, which is really exciting. But what that looked like was I have two people who I very much considered like my coaches, very much with me behind the scenes throughout the entire prep process, helping me with training and kind of mentoring me through the process. I had the folks who were doing the roasting of my coffee. And then once we're actually there at the competition, so when we were in Boston, there were four or five folks helping me throughout the entire process of dialing in and making sure we're all calibrated on tasting notes. And so it's a... It's a huge, huge group of people behind each competitor, even though, for the most part, all you see is that one person on stage at the end of the day. Morgan, thanks so much for joining us here today on Fifth Wave. Thank you for having me. Morgan's motivation is inspiring. She clearly enjoys the challenge and loves coffee deeply. And to succeed at this level, it takes a lot of teamwork, passion, and hundreds upon hundreds of hours of work. We obviously wish Morgan great luck at the World Barista Championships in Melbourne this month. Finally, we're closing out this episode with the winner of the London Coffee Masters 2022, Ratislav Kassar. He likes to go by Rasti. Coffee Masters is a fast-paced, multidiscipline global barista tournament that sees a pair of baristas competing head-to-head simultaneously with the elements of chance thrown in. Rasti trained at a hospitality college in Slovakia and decided to become a barista after taking a coffee course in his college where he discovered his true passion for coffee. Now let's hear from Rusty how competitions pushed him to be a better barista and how it is impacting his career. Welcome, Rastislav. Thank you, my Jeff. Pleasure to be with you. What made you enter the competition in the first place? Uh, at the very beginning, while I was still at school in Slovakia, It was actually a bit of an accident because it wasn't me who was meant to go and represent school. It was a a classmate of mine, but she wasn't able to do it for some reason. And uh, all of a sudden, one of the teachers came to me and be like, oh, you know what, Rusty, this person who was running the course said that he liked you and he saw something in you. Would you like to take a part instead? And I said, yes, of course, I would happily take part. And what was appealing was that someone obviously in the first place, was like, you know what, I feel like you may be a good person to do this. So I did it. And, you know, it was the first competition that obviously went as most of the competitions you the first time. But, you know, there was something very appealing in the sense that uh, I knew I could do better. So the appeal, in my opinion, was at that point, and even at this point, is that competition is an amazing tool of becoming a better version of yourself on personal, on individual, but also on the professional level. How do you think your current workplace benefits from you having won a major global competition? In the first place, we are very sober about these titles because 
competitions are obviously very important, but the most important competition is the one that we do day-to-day basis. So no one would benefit from me being coffee master whilst not being able to follow the daily routine of what coffee shop requires, what the guests of the coffee shop require. But I would be, but hey, I'm a, I am a coffee master. Yes, that's great. But the most important competition, uh, I believe that's the most important one, is the one that we do on a daily basis, not with anyone else, but ourselves. It's the idea of competing with myself, being better I was yesterday. And if there's something I did on Monday, and I will admit personally that, you know, this maybe wasn't good or this could be done better, on Tuesday I want to follow up and I want to make sure that the thing I did that I consider not right will be improved. So I think I think that the, the ultimate benefit of the business is that you don't lose your head because I want them to get to know me or I want to get to know people as person in the first place because I don't mind that you're a you're winner of this or winner of that. What I came here for, if I ask you for coffee, make excellent coffee or make the best coffee you possibly can, bring it to me and be consistent. And maybe in two weeks time, I will ask you and you'll tell me that you're coffee master and I would like it to be to be this way rather than the other way that I say, oh, I'm a coffee master and I'll expect something great. No, I don't think that's a healthy way this works. I think it's uh, the other way around. So what technical skills do you think you might have got better at as a result of training for and competing in a major competition? For example, latte art was a, uh, was a thing I, I kind of never saw the hype of latte art. <laughs> and whilst obviously, you know, I was able to do the kind of classic patterns without any like difficulties. Once I knew that there's some sort of dice <laughs> at the stage that, you know, has different patterns that was designed by Dan Tamang, I was like, oh, these patterns look a bit difficult and I feel like uh, I will need to put some training. You've obviously got an amazing work ethic. I wonder if you could share with our audience how much work is involved to prepare for a major tournament such as Coffee Masters? You know what I think, Jeff, it's the moment it all starts with is the day that you decide you want to be a part of this industry. But not to be a part of this industry for, for two months, three months. It's almost something you need to fall in love with. And uh, what happened was that I was always obsessed with Japanese culture. Uh, with, the, with the with Japanese craftsmanship, and uh, I happened to see this this movie called uh, The Dream of Sushi. It's about a sushi master called Jiro Ono, who runs a three star mission restaurant called Sukiyabashi Jiro in Ginza Station in Tokyo. What happened is that there's a movie about a person who's been making sushi from I think when he was sixteen. At this point, he's ninety six or ninety seven years old, and he's still making sushi. And uh, I got to listen to this story multiple times over and over. And I was like, this person reminds me of something that I do at work. And I, for some reason, fell in love with the whole idea of kind of putting your entire life into the craft that you want to be good at. And in my opinion, and in my, in my case, it's not coffee as a whole. It's not bartending as a whole. It's the hospitality. Because hospitality is a kind of a, a bigger picture of what I do. This is not work. This is not just a daily job. This is almost a belief. This is believing in something greater than what I do. And I am trying to prove it day to day. Every day I'm at the cafe working. This competition, whilst it's checking and it's looking at what you do within the individual categories, it's also important that you present it to, in a certain way. So you can be amazing latte artist, you can be amazing at guessing origins of the coffee or, you know, or, or cupping. But when you, for example, brewing, you are ultimately salesperson. You are convincing judges that what you do is reasonable. You have rationale for what you do. And that's something that you only get to master this when you work in cafe, when you are talking to people about the coffee and, you, and you're seeing the reaction they have when you say, oh, you know what, this is naturally processed coffee from Ethiopia, Oromia region, it tastes like this and this. Would you like to try? And they say no. So, you know, maybe you did something wrong 
when you were presenting the coffee. Next person comes in, asks for a long black or Americano, and I'd be like, you know what, would you like to try maybe batch brew instead of filtered coffee, since you're clearly into black coffee? Some people would be interested, some people wouldn't, that's absolutely fine. What was important, that I got to know, or I got to read people, and I could see what they're after. And in my opinion, a huge part in Coffee Masters, it's the idea of presenting products. It's the idea of presenting coffee. Because once manager at the American bar, Declan McGill, told me, uh, Rusty, you can have the, the most expensive spirits, you can have the most expensive vermouth and glassware and ice. If your presentation sucks, no one cares. You know, people will not be excited to try that. You need to create that excitement first, and then you, you do the rest. So sometimes I feel like this is maybe the misconception within the coffee industry that, yes, we have amazing coffee, we have expensive coffees, and we're done. No, we're not done. We can have maybe average coffee, but we can ultimately make it better if we are able to read what the person, what the guest of the coffee shop is after, and tailor made that entire experience. And I can tell you that it's not easy, and it's, it's definitely a skill to learn because it may sound trivial, but uh, it's not as easy. So this is sometimes, in my opinion, the part of the competition, and especially competition like Coffee Masters, that people don't get to hear about. Rusty, congratulations so much on winning the Coffee Masters this year in London, and thanks for joining us here on Fifth Wave. Thank you much. Rusty shows us how competitions help develop superior technical skills that baristas can embed deeply into their everyday cafe work. And if you're a budding barista or a cafe operator, considering whether or whether not to participate in competitions, for me, the answer is clearly yes, get involved. Even if you don't win, there are strong business and career benefits to participating. And apparently, despite the stress, it's a whole lot of fun. We wish all the competitors in the World Brewster Championships in Melbourne at the end of this month great luck and success. And that's all for this week's Fifth Wave podcast. Please subscribe to the Fifth Wave wherever you get your podcasts. And if you've enjoyed this show, please recommend us to a friend or colleague. If you want to stay informed, visit worldcoffeeportal.com to get access to all the latest global coffee news, including the weekly coffee dose, our newsletter collecting all the big coffee news stories of the week. Link is in the show notes. This episode was produced in the one and only Serendipity Studios in glorious Camden, North London. It was produced by myself, Jeffrey Young, Hannah Heath, James Harper of Filter Productions, and sound engineering by Chris Bristow. And this week's song, in collaboration with the Coffee Music Project, is Summer is for Falling in Love by Sarah Kang. And until next time, stay safe, stay positive, and stay caffeinated. Before the day is dead But maybe the heat of today Could keep even winter away So I'll remember your life Cause nothing ever changes the fact That summer is for falling in love Summer is for falling